It is an unfortunate truth that we allow so many games to die over the years, particularly RPGs. I'm going to share with you five PS1 RPGs that just nobody seems to talk about. And from this, maybe you'll find some kind of obscure RPG that you want to check out, you know, you want to be in the know on. We'll also talk about the general reception of these games at release and how long the game takes to complete. Let's get started. Eternal Eyes. Not to be confused with Internal Eyes, but Eternal Eyes. This game was released at retail for 10 bucks. 10 bucks? And it doesn't go for much more than that now, nearing 30 years later. I'm not sure how I went so long without paying attention to Eternal Eyes. It looks like Final Fantasy Tactics, and that's enough to get me going. And while I have owned it for a long time now, I guess about 13 years or so, I never really played it. When I was younger, I feel like I would have been more forgiving of this game, particularly as I was looking for games like Final Fantasy Tactics because I was so enamored with that game. Had I known this was a thing back in the day when it came out, I probably would have picked it up. I mean, 10 bucks was affordable to me at that point. But as I didn't know, here we are. I mentioned Final Fantasy Tactics because, as you can see, this game looks like Tactics. Granted, it's not as pretty as Tactics is, but you know what? It looks the part. Now I'll never be a teen model. I'll never be anything. What's the point of living? I might as well die. This game has a pretty generic story. And you know, stories are so important to RPGs. However, I can forgive one that is a little bland, a little generic every once in a while, particularly if there is engaging gameplay. A bad summary of this game might be that you are out to save your sister from an evil sorcerer. I don't want to give you too much more than that in case you do decide to play it. The game begins with a beautiful anime opening cutscene. It's bright, it's colorful, it looks looks like anime, but whatever, it, it looks cool, I like it. I gave you a bad summary of the game and I have to admit, it's pretty long-winded to be such a boring and generic story. There's a lot of text to grind through in here. With that, battles kind of take forever as well, but, you know, it's, it is what it is. It's a tactical game. It's not going to be in and out real quick. Here's the basic setup. You go into a battle, you're on a grid, you move about the grid, and you kill enemies. Sometimes the enemies will drop a chest. The crappy thing is that you have to beat this chest open, or you have to wait until the end of the battle to open the chest. The tricky thing is that the monsters will also break open the chest and, like, take your stuff. I don't know what they're going to do with four wooden swords. That's all I was able to get out of the first battle was four wooden swords, none of which I could equip. Just some weird design choices in this game, but it's just, who knows? What I do know is that it has beautiful sprite art, but the trouble with graphics is that having really nice graphics that can make an unfun game suddenly fun. I know I harped on this game a lot already, but I couldn't stop playing it. I had played the game for several hours before I realized that I had been playing the game for several hours. I think what made this more tolerable is the fast forward function from the emulator that I was using. While the game takes a while to move characters from spot to spot, and it takes a while for the enemies to take their turn, especially in the beginning when it's your one character versus six others, but having that fast forward feature made it much more tolerable. Think about it this way. This game is 13 and a half hours long, right? It's not a terribly long RPG, which has some appeal to a lot of people, particularly me. If you use a fast forward function, this will make it that much faster. If you play this game for at least two hours and you enjoy it, it's cheaper than buying a movie ticket. If you don't enjoy it, hey, at least it was cheaper than buying a movie ticket. Most reviews of this game are absolutely dismal, but playing it on an emulator and speeding it up allows you to get through some of the grueling long parts. And again, I had a hard time turning this game off. If nothing else, it's a PS1 RPG. That's important. And maybe the value of it lies in playing a game that is obscure and incompetent at some point. And you can be a champion for that incompetency and obscurity. I mean, that's appealing, right? If you're interested in being a champion for this RPG, maybe you'd be interested in being a champion for an obscure YouTube channel with an incompetent host, right? Hey, hit that subscribe button. Azure Dreams. In Azure Dreams, you play as Ko, whose father, a renowned monster hunter, passed away while he was young. You sort of follow in his footsteps to become a treasure hunter. Your hometown rests at the bottom of this large tower, which is the Monster Tower. People travel here for fame and glory and riches in their hunt for monster eggs. This has created quite the nice little setup for this town. It's almost like Gatlinburg at the foot of the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee in the United States or something. Or really any sort of business outside of a large attraction. I mean Disney World, Disneyland, Las Vegas, whatever. You're going to the monster town and you might as well come and eat at our buffet, you know what I mean? Get you some monster eggs for breakfast or something. Yeah, you, you see, it makes sense. We do this. It's not a far cry. As you turn 15 years old, you become of age to go 
explore this monster tower or Hollywood or whatever and set off on a wild adventure that will lead you back and forth from the town to the tower where you'll battle your way up the tower and use your influence and riches in the town to do some town building aspects. And you'll be picking up some chicks. All right. Sherman is moving to DEFCON 2. Full strategic arsenal. Ready for deployment. Hey. Living the dream, man. Hey girl, have you seen my corn crop? Let me take a peek at you. That's a dumb joke. That's a dumb joke. I'm thinking a good comparison might be the Pokemon craze of the day in Harvest Moon and, and maybe Thousand Arms for the dating aspect. But that's a pretty cool combination, right? And that's all I wanted. That's all any kid wants at that age. The sprite art in this game is of course lovely. I'm a huge fan of the sprite art. And the PS1 is no slouch when it comes to this. This game is not terribly difficult either. It's actually a bit comfy. Thank you, Harvest Moon Vibes. Most of the random reviews I've seen around the internet have put it around a 7 out of 10, which is, you know, pretty average, and certainly good enough to look into if you're into the aspects of this game like farming and dating and monster hunting and Pokemon raising or whatever. Or perhaps you're just a PS1 RPG enthusiast. As your dreams is not one to miss out on. If you've not played the 10 out of 10 bangers on the PlayStation 1, the, the best of the best, then you might wait on this one. But if you played those and you want to check out the rest, this is definitely part of the rest. This game will take you between 25 and 30 hours to beat. No slouch, but not too bad. I'll start a timer for 15 seconds in a moment, place, and music. And in the meantime, what I'd like for you to do is in 15 seconds, jot down as many obscure PS1 games that you can come up with. They don't have to be RPGs, but jot these down in the comments. I would love to read these and then we'll continue on. Here we go. Thank you for that. Moving on to the Grand Stream Saga. The Grand Stream Saga story follows a young man who sets off on a quest to save a girl aligned with a good army, oppose an organization of bad guys and race of floating islands back from the abyss. It's not overtly original, but it's interesting enough for me. Just looking at this game, you'll notice it is smooth as butter. Just everybody moves so incredibly smooth. You'll probably also notice these creepy, faceless people. Like, draw some googly eyes on these people or something. Give them some dots. They are a little spooky. I feel like I owe this game some praise for the anime cutscenes and the character portraits. It is lovely. Like, I really enjoy these cartoon setups and these huge character portraits. Typically, your character portraits are small little things at the bottom, but these are these take up a significant portion of the screen. Your main character walks as stiff as a freaking board. Like he has a stick up his bubba. Hey, no judgment here. The combat is weirdly fun as it's a bit of action thrown onto a battlefield. I enjoyed the battles quite a bit, blocking, dodging, magical abilities, the old back and forth tug of war sort of stuff. But when the battle was over, I noticed something was missing. No experience? Turns out this game doesn't do leveling like normal. The game will tell you when you're the next level. This honestly kind of sucks. It makes me feel like those fun battles are just a waste. If I can avoid battles, I would because I don't get experience from them. There is no grinding necessary in this game. Nothing. And I'm truly not a fan of this sort of setup. I enjoy the grind to some extent. I enjoy building my character and leveling up and strengthening my character from the, the battles so they don't feel like they're a waste of my time. What's the point of an RPG when I can't level my character and stat my character as I please? There is charm to this game, but the lack of experience was a nail in the coffin for me. This game is only about 16 hours long and it received some pretty average reviews on release. And honestly, that's that's a fair assessment. It's an experience, and again, if you played all the best, check out the rest. And, you know, well, this is the rest. Let's take a moment and thank my sponsors. I got Bubby Cat, Viking, and Luther Bob. But really, these guys are uh, currently patron saints of my channel, and I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Shadow Madness. Shadow Madness is a plague that is spreading across the world in this turn-based RPG. And the protagonist, whose town was destroyed, big surprise, travels to find a way to bring an end to this chaos. This game, just look at it. I want you to know that this was touted as a Final Fantasy VII killer. That was sort of a thing back then. I mean, maybe it is now to some extent that I'm not aware of, but every game was the killer of the biggest dude on the block. Shadow Madness was the Final Fantasy VII killer. Dark Cloud was the Zelda killer. I mean, sure. I like to root for the little guy as much as anybody else, but come on guys, really? Let's be realistic about it. This game, just like every other game on this list, is just okay. It's available on Steam for 15 bucks, and it's probably worth the price to see what some folks were considering the Final Fantasy VII killer, but it's certainly not extraordinary. 
I think a lot of this game's credit can be given to its intentions to be targeted at a more mature audience. Given the success of Final Fantasy VII's mature storyline, it makes sense that this would follow suit. And at the time of this video, Final Fantasy XVI has provided a more mature storyline and I'm sure that we're going to continue to see this build a little further into mainstream RPGs. The story of this game reminded me somewhat of The Walking Dead, as it's not as much the monsters that are the issues, but the way that people react to the threat of danger, which is a really cool concept. But this game just looks so rough. It is certainly dated. And while other games at the time could look as bad, you have to remember that this game released in May, and four months later, the Dreamcast launched. That's pretty rough. Graphically, this game was kind of in its grave before it even got started, and it's since been commonly known as the game that tried to be Final Fantasy VII, for better or for worse. You won't have eyes tonight. You won't have ears or a tongue. You will wander the underworld blind, deaf, and dumb, and all the dead will know. This is Hector, the fool who thought he killed Achilles. This might be a game for folks that want to take and dive in and see the history and how history treats its failures. Consider what the issues were, and that's something that I like to do. I love watching expensive blockbusters that bombed for some reason. I think trying to find value in these efforts is enjoyable, and that is my pitch for Shadow Madness. If you want to see a not-so-beautiful failure, check it out. It'll run you over 30 hours to see it to the end, but if that's what floats your bow, baby have at it. What is a video game you're aware of that was supposed to be the killer of another franchise? Sort of like how Shadow Madness was supposed to be the Final Fantasy VII killer. What's another game that you heard was the killer of another franchise? Take a moment and drop your response in the comments below. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Onward! Guardian's Crusade. This is one of the better received games on this list. Guardian's Crusade is the story of Knight and his trick with a little creature named Baby. That was the summer of 1963, when everybody called me Baby and it didn't occur to me to mind. Actually, in Japan, the game was called, appropriately enough, Knight and Baby. The story sees the knight traveling when he is gifted Baby in a flash of light. A voice tells him to deliver Baby to the God's Tower where he came from. When he tells the mayor about Baby, the mayor says, Beat that kid in a cave and move on, which we do. Dang, tough break for Baby. But Knight eventually feels pretty crummy about this and goes back to retrieve Baby. Because, well, as we all know, Nobody puts Baby in a corner. Once Knight rescues Baby, they continue on their journey, meeting other people along the way. This game has some goofy graphics. This looks like some of the earliest 3D models you could find at the time, but I guess it works, as it's all similar. Kind of fits the overall aesthetic, right? Oddly enough, I feel like it sort of looks similar to Spyro's graphics. Maybe I'm crazy, but it's, again, it's weirdly appealing to me. I like the text graphics in particular, the graphics in the battle, those look really nice. The fact that mobs are present on the open field, I like that stuff too. I particularly like the boldness of the title, Night and Baby, like, screw it, just tell them what it's about. Don't sugarcoat this for me. If we could stick to this naming style instead of Death Stranding, we truly could have had Norman Reedus' Funky Fetus. But here we are. This game is super cute. It works fine, it does its job, it's just odd enough to be appealing too. It gets my recommendation. If you're looking for something weird on the PS1 for an RPG, this is, there's a lot out there. But this is a definitely an odd one. This is one to check out. There you go, five obscure RPGs for the PS1 nobody just talks about anymore, unfortunately. Maybe they are talking about it, and I'm just not hearing it, but I don't, I don't see it. I don't hear about these games very often at all. I know I've already asked you to respond twice already in the video, in the comments, but if you haven't done those, that would be a great time to do that, because I really do enjoy reading your comments and responding to your comments, because I read every single one. I mean, after all, gaming discourse is important, and we should continue. Somebody better talk about these RPGs. 